From 1804 to 1814, one of the greatest military commanders to have ever lived, who won more battles than either Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, ruled in France. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte, and his tactics in warfare are studied even today by tacticians for modern warfare. And one of his maxims of war that he delivered when discussing a battle that he won in 1805, uh, around the time of the French Revolution, was never interrupt an enemy when he is making a mistake. This is good advice. I like this. I really like this quote because as a Christian, our relationship with our enemy is its very interesting. It's very different than the world's relationships with their enemies. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. We're supposed to love our enemies. But this quote points out that it doesn't mean that just because we pray for them and love them doesn't mean we get to just allow attacks on ourselves openly by our enemies. It doesn't mean we can't be glad when the enemy fails at making attack on us. They make a mistake while they're trying to attack us. That's a great thing. We should be okay with that. Yes, pray for them, but not pray for their success over us. So I, I really like this quote. Never interrupt an enemy when he's making a mistake because you can learn from your enemy's mistakes and it can put you in an advantageous position. The enemy that we're up against is a cosmic enemy. Evil spirit beings, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, and fortunately for us, these are imperfect beings. They make a lot of mistakes. And even when they do everything according to plan, right, their plan goes perfectly without, or just seamlessly for what they're planning to do, we serve a perfect being that doesn't make mistakes and can turn even the things they thought they succeeded in, that he can turn that to a benefit for us, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, as it says in Romans 8.28. So even in times when everyone around us seems evil, the time we live in seems evil, and it's really hard to see good anywhere, which I think, I mean, like it or not, is a time we kind of find ourselves in right now, we should practice seeing what God is doing with those evil things and how he's turning them to our benefit, what he's able to do through the bad on, be on behalf of the good. So today we're going to practice this by looking at three actions of our adversary, Satan, that will turn out to be mistakes. Even though they went according to plan for him, they're going to turn out to be mistakes, as we'll see, because God can teach us incredible truths about himself through Satan's actions. So the first mistake that I see Satan making is his estimation of himself. Satan thought too highly of himself. If you'll turn to Ezekiel 28... Now, in Ezekiel 28, this is a prophetic section of Scripture, there are two sections about the leaders of the kingdom of Tyre. There's the prince of Tyre in one section, and it switches to talking about the king of Tyre. Many commentaries will point out that the prince of Tyre is probably most likely Ethbaal or Ethbaal III, uh, depending on how you pronounce his name. And his name literally meant living with God, or basically hanging out with God, dwelling with God, being around God. This points to a certain status that he saw himself as having. He assumed this name and this title on himself, and he, he lived it out. So the first section about the Prince of Tyre really fits well with his historical figure. But the second section about the King of Tyre doesn't really line up with this person's life. And most people understand this is probably more accurately a prophecy about Satan. So in Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 12, it says this about him. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Now, sometimes the image of Satan in our heads is that he's disgusting, he's putrid, he's a creeping being that just is gross and we just ugh, despise and just don't want to be around him. And that's all true. I mean, there, there's, there's an element to Satan in his nature that is just wretched. He is deluded. He is evil. He is corrupt. But he wasn't made this way. 
So let's not disparage the creation of the being, Satan, along with what he chose to do with that creation, how he chose to ruin it. He was, and in some sense still is, an incredible being. Even though we dislike him, he dislikes us, even though he's evil and corrupt, his creation is astounding because God made him. It's a display of God's creative power. So what can we learn from this first mistake that Satan made in that he esteemed himself too highly? Well, I would say that he didn't esteem himself, so, he wouldn't have esteemed himself so much if he hadn't been worth at least some esteem in the first place. So the thing we can draw from this is that God makes incredible, powerful, glorious, beautiful creations that are made to glorify him. Now, Satan ruined that, but we don't have to. We're made in his image. We are incredible beings created by God to glorify him, and we shouldn't sell ourselves short. So in in esteeming Satan properly as a creation of God, not in saying that everything he does is good, but understanding that he is an incredible being, we can see that our God makes incredible beings, and we're fortunate to be a part of that. Now, the second mistake, Satan rebelled against God. This is the the action he took because he esteemed himself so highly. In Isaiah 14, you don't have to turn there. You can if you'd like. I'll be in verse 13 and 14. It's a common section believed to be in reference to Satan and his rebellion. And there are listed five I will statements that Satan claimed. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Now, most commentaries point that this is, these are five steps of ascension. This is a plan that kind of goes one after the other, closer and closer, approaching God to try and overtake or overthrow him. This was evil. This was wrong. Satan esteemed himself too highly, and he saw God as approachable, And so he tried to approach, and this was wrong. But what can we learn from this mistake? I think we can learn that only a God who is approachable would anyone dream they could approach. Even in his delusion, he understood that God was approachable. Yes, he is all-powerful. He is almighty. He is incredible. He is awesome. But he's also our loving father. He calls us to him. He draws us to him. He wants his creation to come to him, to look to him. He's approachable. Now, Satan saw this as a weakness, and he tried to exploit it, but hopefully we can see that we can approach God, but we should do it with reverence and humility. Now, the third mistake that Satan makes is that he targets us. I know this seems like, doesn't seem like a mistake. It's working out pretty well because he's making it pretty difficult, but this is actually a mistake. He targets us. I'm going to read off a few scriptures um, just to put in your notes for reference. Uh, Luke 22, 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat. He targets Simon or, or Peter. In Revelation 12, 10, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, Satan hinders Paul from coming to the brethren, direct hindrance of Paul. And then in 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan prowls around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's listed as our enemy. But this is a mistake. What can we learn from this? When an enemy attacks, they don't attack unimportant or irrelevant things. They attack what matters. The Japanese in 1941 did not attack an empty field. And the Islamic extremists in 2001 did not attack an abandoned building. They attacked what mattered, what sent a message. And Satan, right now, is attacking what matters. And what matters to God is you. This is what we can learn from this. There's a quote in one of Aesop's fables that says, The haft of an arrow has been feathered with one of the eagle's own plumes. How frustrating it must be for Satan right now, as a living being, fully able to hear what I'm talking about right now, to know that his three greatest actions that seem to go all according to plan can actually be his undoing because God can use them for good to our benefit.